these are my disclosures and uh, none of them are particularly relevant to this uh, talk. Again, uh, greetings uh, on the Republic Day for India, 74th, as it was mentioned, uh, and many congratulations to one and all for this. Now, if you look at the problem statement for uh, femoral neck fractures, it's, it's a whole uh, global problem as such. So worldwide, we're seeing about 1.3 million fractures uh, that occur per annum. In the UK, we are looking at about 70,000 hip fractures. This is projected to increase to more than 6 million uh, by 2050 worldwide. And the global cost uh, that is estimated is about 1.75 million disability adjusted life years lost uh, and represent a significant amount of total healthcare burden in any established economy. So it is a big problem for any, any country and orthopedic surgeons are probably best suited to actually handle this. So what I want to do in my talk is talk about uh, the evidence that we have, talk about the NICE guidance in the UK, which is based on the evidence, and then some conclusions and uh, advice for the future. So if we look at evidence, then the first thing that we need to understand is a core outcome set. What exactly exactly is the evidence based on. Now, uh, in the UK, uh, essentially, there was a lack of consensus for looking at what exactly are we looking at post uh, fixation of femoral neck fractures. So therefore, this consensus uh, took place on development of core health outcomes. So essentially, whichever study or clinical trial that you do, uh, you want to be looking at specific outcomes and so that you can compare at the end of it. And the consensus supported five domain core outcome sets, that is mortality uh, after the uh, fixation, pain, activities of daily living, health-related quality of life uh, as well, and potentially return to theater. So these were the ones that we are looking at in terms of the outcomes or the core outcome set. So any study that we look at, will be looking at this. So the first study that I want to bring to your notice is uh, this one, that's the internal fixation implants for intracapsular fractures in older adults. Uh, this is all done uh, through Cochrane. They're in the Cochrane library. And essentially, these are all uh, meta-analysis uh, as well. And I'll present three to you. So the first one uh, is 38 studies. It included 32 randomized control trials with over 8,000 uh, participants and over 8,500 intracapsular fractures mean ages between 60 to 84, uh, mainly women, and 38% of the fractures here were undisplaced. And the findings of the four main comparisons uh, between different categories of implants were actually assessed. I won't bore you with the tiny details, but essentially the results showed that there was little or no difference between the screws and fixed angle plates in the functional status health-related quality of life or mortality at 12 months, or in fact, even unplanned return to theater. The same core outcome set that we actually talked about. There was some difference between screws and pins in terms of mortality at 12 months, but this is limited and very low certainty evidence. That's what they've said in this meta-analysis. And additional randomized controlled trials would increase the certainty of evidence. So that's the first uh, meta-analysis. The second one, again, from Cochrane, is surgical interventions for treating intracapsular fractures in the older adults. But this is a network meta-analysis now. And a large number of studies included, again, 119 studies with over 17,000 uh, participants and 17,600 intracapsular fractures. Again, mean age between 60 to 87 years and about 73% for women. The results are interesting here. That is the cemented modern unipolar uh, hemiarthroplasty. A uh, dynamic fixed angle plate and pins seem to have the greatest likelihood of return, reducing mortality at 12 months. And the next statement is very important as well. That is about 23.5% of the participants who received the reference treatment, that is any treatment, actually died within 12 months of surgery. So fairly high mortality in this a patient cohort in this age group. Now, uncemented modern bipolar hemiarthroplasty had higher mortality than the reference treatment. And again, total hip arthroplasty with single articulation also had higher mortality in this uh, network meta-analysis. And in the remaining treatments, again, 
Certainty of evidence ranged from low to very low. Actually, you cannot make any robust conclusions from there. But these two are important. So conclusions from here were that cemented modern arthroplasties tended to actually give you better outcomes than alternative treatments and a more successful approach than internal fixation. No evidence of a difference between total hip arthroplasty, single articulation, and a cemented modern a unipolar hemiarthroplasty in the outcomes that were measured. And finally, total hip arthroplasty may be an appropriate treatment, but in a subset of patients with intracapsular fracture, but this needs to be explored further. So again, no definite outcome that total hip arthroplasty does better than a hemiarthroplasty. Then the final uh, Cochrane review was on arthroplasties for hip fractures in adults, specifically looking at arthroplasties. Again, 58 studies in this with over 10,000 participants, mean age again from 63 to 87 with more females. And the conclusions from this analysis was that for people undergoing hemiarthroplasty for an intracapsular hip fracture, it is likely that a cemented prosthesis actually gave a better outcome, global outcome, particularly in terms of health-related quality of life and also in terms of mortality. There was no evidence to suggest that a bipolar hemiarthroplasty was superior to a unipolar prosthesis. And finally, any benefit of total hip arthroplasty compared with arthroplasty was likely to be small and not clinically appreciable. So that's the third uh, meta-analysis on Cochrane. Now from meta-analysis, let's move on to another bit of evidence, which is uh, the trial actually, which uh, changed a lot of people's thinking in the UK at least, that's the NEJM. Uh, health investigator study of total hip arthroplasty versus hemiarthroplasty. A really good trial with over 1,400 patients, 50 years or over, trial conducted in 80 centers in uh, 10 countries. But primary endpoint here was secondary hip procedure within 24 months of follow-up. That's the main thing that they're looking at. And then secondary outcome measures were death, serious adverse events, hip-related complications, health-related quality of life function, and all the core outcome set points that we've talked about. But primary outcome measure is secondary hip procedure. So interesting results, and two of them are fairly important. So obviously the primary endpoint occurred uh, similarly in both the hemiarthroplasty and the uh, total hip replacement group. Hip instability or dislocation, you can see, is in 34 patients, 4.7% in the total hip arthroplasty compared to 17, which is 2.4% in the hemiarthroplasty group. Uh, functional scores favored, modestly favored the total hip arthroplasty over hemiarthroplasty, and mortality was similar in both the groups. Serious adverse events occurred in 300 patients, uh, about 41.8% assigned to the total hip arthroplasty, and in about 36.7% assigned to the hemiarthroplasty. So two more important things here, that mortality you're looking at, and you're looking at hip instability or dislocation. And that's, uh, that's the graph it shows. Initially, probably total hip arthroplasty causing more issues, but at the end of 24 months, both coming out uh, at similar, uh, in terms of uh, secondary procedure done similar. So among independently ambulating patients, they concluded with displaced femoral neck fractures, the incidence of a secondary procedure did not differ significantly between the patients who were randomly assigned either to a total hip arthroplasty or a hemiarthroplasty. And total hip arthroplasty provided a clinically unimportant improvement over hemiarthroplasty in function and in quality of life over 24 months. But obviously long-term, we need to see what happens. Another NEJM study looking at cemented versus uncemented arthroplasty clearly favoring that cemented arthroplasties actually do much better uh, in terms of function uh, as compared with the uncemented hemiarthroplasties. Now, if you put all this evidence together and look at uh, the NICE, which is the National Institute for Health and Clinical uh, Excellence in the UK and their uh, guidelines on fracture management, and this was updated recently on the 6th of Jan, uh, 2023. So this is fairly hot off the press. And, this is important to understand here now. They recommend that we should be operating on people with the aim to allow them to fully weight bear. That's the first thing in the immediate post-operative period. Therefore, we should be offering replacement arthroplasty, total hip replacement or hemiarthroplasty to people with a displaced intracapsular hip fracture. 
And then this, again, is based on the evidence that has come through. That is, you want to consider a total hip replacement rather than a hemi for people with a displaced fracture who are able to walk, who were able to walk independently out of doors with no more than one stick prior to the operation. They do not have a condition or comorbidity that makes the procedure unsuitable for them. And most importantly, you are expecting them to be able to carry out activities of daily living independently beyond two years of the operation. So if you meet these three, then the nice recommendation is that you should potentially offer them a total hip replacement. So essentially it boils down to picking winners and stratification. So obviously you need to have a surgeon who's able to do a total hip replacement as well as AME arthroplasty. You need the right setting so that you can measure the appropriate outcomes in these patients. But most importantly, you need the right patient. And all those three conditions should be actually confirmed before you offer them a total hip arthroplasty. Now, a bit more digging, if you look at it, and I'll be looking at these meta-analyses in a bit more detail. And the number of papers and the, the amount of data that comes out from India actually in these papers is fairly minimal. So you really need to ask yourself, and I probably uh, can be spearheading this, are these two patients similar? They've got different socioeconomic status. They've got diff different work profile patterns. Uh, they've got different comorbidities. And should we be actually looking at the data and the network meta-analysis from the UK and all these other places for our own patients in India? Because I think they're pretty different in the socioeconomic status, in their comorbidities, in their longevity, and also their expectations. So we really need more data from India to actually be deciding what is the best for these patients. Because some of them may, may require fairly different outcomes as compared to the West. And essentially, it's coming down to this dictum that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And then unless and until we start getting data from this part of the world, and again, as I say, IA is probably best place to start collecting this data, I think it'll be very difficult to make uh, assumptions and actually dictate clinical guidelines based on data from the West. So I really encourage uh, all of you uh, and IA to lead on this, to actually start collecting data, uh, look at what exactly happens to the patients uh, having fixation, having hemiarthroplasty and having total arthroplasties in that part of the world, and then make decisions uh, based on that, because data is really the new oil. And I'll stop with that. I want to invite you to uh, our next BHS annual meeting in Edinburgh, which would be my meeting. So warm welcome to all of you. It was really good to see a lot of abstracts being submitted uh, from India as well for this meeting. I'd really like to invite you for this. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. I'll stop there. Thank you, Vikas. Yeah, Shubhranshu, please take, take on. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks, because that's a beautiful overview of uh, the you know, arthroplasty in fracture neck femur and uh, the meta-analysis and all. Uh, so uh, definitely, Abhay will have some some overlapping of this uh, topic about the literature review. So what what, uh, what is the current uh, practice in your practice? Who, who, who are the patients you select for totally arthroplasty? Who are the patients you select for bipolar in your in your own practice? Yeah, so to be honest with you, we don't do any bipolars. We only do unipolar uh, Exeter cemented hemiarthroplasty. And uh, as the NICE guidance says, we stick to those three things. That is, if the patient does not have any major comorbidities, which uh, will preclude a total hepatoplasty on them, they should be fairly mobile uh, prior to their index uh, fall. And finally, they should have at least two years more in them after the operation to be able to get back to the similar activities that they were. So fairly fit and healthy patients, we would consider a total hip arthroplasty. The other issue is that not every uh, surgeon who's on the trauma rotor can uh, perform a total hip arthroplasty. So some of these patients may be waiting for a long time to actually have that total hip arthroplasty. Uh, so we've got a total hip arthroplasty rotor uh, so that only surgeons are doing a 
total hip replacement regularly are actually operating on these patients. So fairly strict conditions is what I would say. Uh, Ronald, you have a question? Yeah, before yeah. we go to the other questions, I have got one more thing to ask you. What is the what percentage of your practice you are doing dual mobility hips uh, in fracture neck femur? Are you doing each and every case of fracture neck femur considering the high rate of dislocation? No. So uh, again, the dual mobility is uh, hardly hardly in use here. Either it's a unipolar exeter or a total hip. Yeah. Just to run in, yeah. continue on that, uh, uh, because uh, as regards the bipolar, is it a trend that's gradually going out in the UK, or then are most hospitals uh, shifting over to unipolars now? No, I mean, I think if you look at the evidence from what we've got at the moment, there is no evidence that bipolar is better than a unipolar in, in any which way or form. So why would one use bipolar? Yeah. That's a fair point. Dr. Sam? Yeah, my question was same what you asked actually. I was looking at it that if you are looking for a total hip, are we looking for a dual mobility considering the chance of dislocation rather than doing a bipolar which could provide us a more safer environment in perceptions with Indian patients with more chances of getting down to the ground and all those things. So that you had already... And, and and, and Prof. Sen, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, it, it is not good to be clouded by the data from the West. I really think that uh, from India, we need more data because there are so many uh, femoral neck fractures happening in India and such good outcomes, uh, even for extracapsular fractures with uh, bipolars coming in. But the data is clouded because hardly any bipolars are done here. So we'll never actually get to see that data unless the data comes from India. Yeah, very, very right, uh, uh, Vikas. Because one question that uh, uh, you're doing mostly cemented, uh, cemented unipolar. Uncemented, uncemented is out in terms of hemiarthroplasty. Only do cemented hemiarthroplasty. So, and that so again, what is, yeah, on that. my question is, what is your, uh, uh, your in your experience, uh, what has been the embolism chances in your patients? Pulmonary last, embolism. Uh, personally, in the last uh, 17 years, I haven't seen a single one in my consultant life. Right. Rajkumar, you have a question? Yeah. yeah uh, uh, thank you and uh, uh, good evening, Dr. Vikas. Uh, you mentioned about this unipolar and uh, bipolar. Actually, in India, it is the other way around. It is the bipolar. Which, if at all, HEMI is done nowadays, it is the bipolar which is being done. But you said bipolar is out of question. Can you just tell me what is the uh, big advantage of doing a unipolar? Because here what we had as a unipolar was all Thompson's and Austin Moves, which is now not, not even existing nowadays. So why unipolar are better when compared to a bipolar? What I'm saying is that... In the regards to HEMI, I'm telling. I'm asking in regards yeah, to exactly. HEMI. Ah. In, regards, in regards to a HEMI, there is no... Mm -hmm. In, in the data that we've seen, in the meta-analysis that we've seen, there is no added advantage of a bipolar over a unipolar. The other theoretical papers actually also state that a unipolar, uh, that a bipolar stops functioning as a bipolar in a few years' time and it'll function as a unipolar. So what, what I'm trying to say is that if y'all are doing so many bi unipo sorry, bipolars, please get us the data of the bipolars to show that they are better than the unipolars because at the moment, there's no data to suggest that. Very right, Vikas. So now we'll request uh, Abhay Lens to, uh, to give yeah, us the details before about that. The... Before yeah. that, uh, there are a couple sure, of sure, questions right. in the yeah. chat box. Uh, mm -hmm. Jit Kumar is a question. Is, of course, there is so much a primary way in the UK that involves a sort of long. Does that make a difference in decision making? Mm -hmm. It certainly does, but again, it boils down to those three facts. If the patient has significant amount of OA, but they're not suitable for a hip replacement, uh, either medically or otherwise, then they won't get a hip replacement. Okay. Vijay Jain, I think we have answered your question. What's the problem if you use bipolar? What's bothering us? We have discussed that thing. Karthik Reddy, that do you have modular unipolar, which uh, with modular bipolar, we can create desirable offset. In that way, it's superior. Is there any it's, it's, the same offsets. it's the same offsets that you have for Exeter, right? 
Okay. So All right. Thank, thank you, Vikas. So, let's uh, move on to Abhay. So let's, about the, yeah. yes, let's hear from Abhay now uh, about the, what the review of literature says. Abhay, please. Uh, so thank you all. Am I audible? Yeah, but you are. Yes, you are. Okay. Yes, thank you. You are. Yeah. So a lot of what I'm going to speak today is exclusively systematic reviews and meta analysis. And rather than go into the nitty gritties of them all, I will speak on the common findings uh, of what these uh, uh, what these meta analysis say. So if you look at arthroplasty for displaced fracture neck femurs, and then I'm essentially going to be talking of displaced fracture neck femurs. You can essentially divide them and the literature that is existent today into three broad categories. So first is arthroplasty being done for patients between 40 and 59 years. The second subset is patients between 60 and 79 years. And the third subset is patients between uh, who are more than 80 years. So significantly, what is the difference? And no literature touches upon that. So I've put together something that we all use in our daily practice in the decision-making paradigm as to what we are going to give or offer a particular patient. And the variables basically are the degree of functional activity. So a normal adult male does about one to three or, or two to four million cycles per year of loading, repetitive loading. Uh, similarly, those, those amount of functional mobilization or activity will vary for somebody who's 60 to 79 and more than 80 years. And depending upon whether they are a healthy, active, mobile person, are they community ambulators or what exactly are they? The second thing which is important and which we consider is the expected bone stock. And uh, the next thing is Basically, we're looking at expected longevity. So in a 40 to 59 years old, you're looking at something like 25 years follow-up. In a 60 to 79 years, you're looking at something like 15 years follow-up and more than 80 years, you're essentially talking one year survivorship, three year survivorship, and what happens at five years. And the beauty of it all is that literature beyond 80 years essentially is incomplete because there is a huge about 30% dropout in patients whom we operate at 80 years. So even the existent literature does not really know what is happening uh, to people who are uh, not very mobile, who do not have a lot of years in them. And uh, irrespective of whether they are 80, some of them might be lesser number, lesser uh, in age but they may have comorbidities to suggest that their life expectancy is something like what a, a, a what the 80, 85, or a 90 year old might be. The other important thing is the existence of comorbidities and uh, the Carlson comorbidity score, the Carlson comorbidity index is very, very important. And that is essentially something that we do factor in, in terms of what a 10 year mortality is going to be in somebody with different types of uh, uh, comorbidities. The other thing that we all look at and do not have enough data to say how that governs our treatment is frailty and body reserve, right? So these are things that we actually look at when we are looking to treat our patients. And these are pretty much uh, what is everything or what is not uh, written in literature but we will talk about what the literature says. So arthroplasty in 40 to 59 years. So if you carefully look at these two women, beautiful women, you essentially know what we are talking about. So the decision in this subset is fix or replace. And the decision is whether it's a 50 year old healthy adult or it's a 50 year old with some kind of comorbidity or disease or something in the fracture geometry, which will cause failure of the internal fixation. So the debate here is fix or replace. So if you look at the comorbid risk factors for failure for internal fixation in younger patients, that is the 40 to 49 and the 50 to 59 group, essentially we're looking at risk factors, which mean delay in time to fixation of more than 24 hours, patients who have alcohol excess, liver disease, respiratory disease, with outcome measures of union, failure of fixation, non-union and patients going into AVN. And it is said that the significance of failures in patients more than 40 
has a statistical significance. So in this subset of patients, there is a role of arthroplasty rather than internal fixation. Another, uh, another systematic review, which essentially says that do you retain the head of the femur on the top of uh, the femur neck or you put it into the dustbin? So the literature today says that fractures with verticality, the neck femur fractures, those with posterior comminution and those with a varus reduction are those fractures which have a very high incidence of failure, even in younger patients. And we are talking younger means 40 to 60 year age group, as high as about 40%. And definitely arthroplasty has a role and the kind of implants and uh, we have today, it definitely has a role there. So fixation versus arthroplasty, propensity match trial, 40 to 49 years and 50 to 59 years. And the outcome was that though internal fixation is historically the treatment of choice for the young non-geriatric patients, but certain subsets of these patients will have high reoperation rates at three years post fixation. And with the importance of improved survivorship of the modern day bearing, one needs to question the above paradigm. So we are talking in terms of shared decision-making with patients. Another trial, similar uh, outcomes. And the important thing is that you consider uh, an arthroplasty in a young patient where you have a concomitant osteoarthritis, a concomitant rheumatoid arthritis, a neck femur for a pathology, because these treatments offer cost effectiveness and they give lower revision rates. So the question that we're asking is, does arthroplasty give better outcomes than internal fixation at long-term follow-up? So these are a couple of RCTs with a minimum four-year follow-up, and they say, in terms of patient mortality, there is no difference on the medium term or the long term. In terms of re-operation rates, arthroplasty has a lower risk at the medium term and the long term. In terms of functional recovery, Arthroplasty does better at the medium term, but if you look at the long term, it is the same for both, especially in those cases where the fracture goes into stable union in anatomical position. The risk of infection in ipsilateral femur fractures, there is no difference between the two subsets. So what does it boil down to? It boils down to what is the best first procedure that you want to offer your patient with a fracture neck of femur where the chances of failure are high. So if you look at the data for uh, longevity of uh, the open reduction and in internal fixations, it says that 80% of the young hips with a displaced fracture neck femur will retain their heads 10 years from the surgery. And if you look at the operative treatment, uh, for fracture neck femurs between the age, age groups, it says the 10-year survivorship of the native head free of conversion total hip arthroplasty was about 85%, which is a very good record. And the ones that failed essentially were also because of osteonecrosis requiring further surgery. Coming on to arthroplasty for the same subset of patients, the important difference the minute we start off in terms of arthroplasty is that when you look at 15 year survivorship, which is more than five years of uh, the survivorship for the neck femurs, we are talking of the same results, like 85.74 accumulative survivorship index of various published literature, saying that 85% 85 of, 85 of these fractures, uh, of these uh, operated patients will survive for 15 years. Going on, the survivorship is not so bad even at 20 years. So 78.8, that is about 79 to 80% of them would have survived their first procedure at 20 years. Going on further to 25 years follow-up after the first procedure, 78 to 80% of these in a cumulative survivorship percentage will survive at 25 years. So obviously in a patient who you want to offer the best first procedure with the least risk of revision, it's going to be an arthroplasty. But it's not that the arthroplasty has to be done for all. 
They are to be done when patients with difficult reduction scenarios, poor bone stock, alcoholics, smokers, and patients with associated osteoarthritis, rheumatoid, and systemic disease. Coming to the other bag of patients where the arthroplasty is in 60 to 79 years, same, same age, different uh, body habitus, different status. And again, if you look at longevity, bone stock, quality of comorbidities, uh, frailty, this is totally a different ball game. And the question we are asking here is not internal fixation, but do they get a total hip arthroplasty or a hemiarthroplasty? And what makes us decide is what is the literature or what is my particular patient going to tilt towards in terms of quality of life, lower complications, and longevity of procedures? Because these are patients where we are looking at something like a 10 or a 15 year uh, follow up or a longevity. So if you look at, and these are all systematic reviews and meta analysis. So if you're looking at what they have to say with modern degree of certainty is that hemiarthroplasty and total hip arthroplasty have similar revision rates. They have similar function, mortality rates, periprosthetic fracture rates, and dislocation rates at five years. There is a marginally small statistically significant benefit in terms of quality of life for total hip arthroplasty. And there is a clinically insignificant reduction in operative time with hemiarthroplasty. Another literature, another systematic reviews, 10 studies, 14, 19 patients. The outcome is the, the primary outcome measure being mortality and the secondary outcome measures being reoperation, infection, dislocation, and metabolic and hemodynamic uh, complications. So lower mortality and dislocation rates at one year, but for hemi and totals, there are similar reoperation rates, similar infection rates, and similar rates of thromboembolic events. Another systematic review, again, what they are talking of is that despite higher dislocation rates, and here we start talking about complications of a standard conventional total hip arthroplasty, that despite having a higher dislocation rate, total hip arthroplasty is better than hemiarthroplasty with lower reoperation rates and higher functional scores. And that is the reason why the world has started tilting a little bit towards total hip arthroplasty for this subset of population. But the question then what we ask is, is there a solution to the higher dislocation rate with total hip arthroplasty as compared to hemi? And let's look at what the literature says. So comparing bipolar hemi arthroplasties and total hip arthroplasties for displaced neck femurs, another meta-analysis, eight RCTs, 1014 patients, equally distributed between a bipolar hemi replacement and a total hip arthroplasty. And what does it say? Bipolars have better outcomes regarding dislocation rate, Total hip arthroplasty is better because it causes lesser acetabular erosion and has lesser reoperation rates. But there is no significant difference in terms of functional outcomes, which are measured by HADASIP score, by infection rates, and general complications in a one year mortality. So, the answer or the question to increase dislocation rates, which is dual mobility, and how does the dual mobility fare? in the treatment of displaced femur neck fractures. So another systematic review where they have compared the outcomes of dual mobility total hip arthroplasty with a bipolar hemi replacement for a displaced neck femur. So the dual mobilities have shown at one year to have lower dislocation rates, reoperation rates, which are better than, and mortality rates, which are, bet which are improved as compared to a bipolar hemi replacement. Another situation where you are again looking at dual mobility components and what they have to say is that if you compare dual mobility now between a bipolar and a conventional total hip arthroplasty, so obviously we are basically trying to find a solution for the conventional total hip where the dislocation rates are an issue. What is evident is that there are lower dislocation rates for dual mobility and the future cost benefit analysis still needs to be understood. So though we assume and we expect and we see uh, lower dislocation rates in the shorter term, 
how a dual mobility is going to pan out in terms of cost effectiveness, long term benefit is still something that we do not have enough data for. The arthroplasty in more than 80 years, and that's the final subset. So these two women, similar ages, a little different, but then how do you look at them? On one hand is an active, healthy ambula community ambulator. On the other hand is a housebound, frail, post 80 year old. And here the decision is whether you do a hemi or you do a total. And no literature actually really talks about the, uh, the aspects of Carlson comorbidity index, the frailty index, and the other aspects of uh, bone stock, et cetera, as a deciding factor in this age group. But it is a very, very important thing to decide and, and, and take into consideration whether you want to do uh, a hemi or a total in this group. So literature says that comorbidities and complications uh, and causes of death among people with neck fracture need to be understood because patients with cancer, with dependency on activities, personal activities of daily living, patients with cardiovascular disease, dementia, pulmonary embolus or cardiac failures during hospitalization have an ind that have a higher risk for a one year and a three year mortality. And these are independent risk factors for mortality. So the interventions are focused to mobilize the patient early, as Vikas very clearly enunciated, to minimize complications in this subset of patients and aim at giving them a reasonable quality of life. Another subset, which now talks about surgical treatment of femoral neck fractures. So in elderly patients, definitely arthroplasty is the treatment of choice. For a higher demand patient with better bone stock, with reasonably less comorbidities, conventional dual mo total hip or a dual mobility total hip is the way to go. In a low demand patient, a hemi is the way to go. Cement, if you think about cementless versus cemented, there is no argument that cemented hemi does much better. However, the basic a uh, perceived sh shortcoming with a cemented hemi is that certain subset of patients will have a bone cement implantation syndrome. And this is that subset which definitely has the cardiac comorbidities. But with current modern day ICUs, with current perioperative intervention uh, intensivist care, these can be taken care of. So the only people who are really a dilemma as to what to do in case of fracture neck femurs is the very frail with moderate to severe uh, cards with comorbidity indices where you wonder whether you should do a, a, a cemented hemi or a cementless, but the, the literature tells very strongly in favor of cemented hemi. So coming back as a take home to our basic uh, paradigm, which we started off with, as to what you need to consider in a patient uh, before give, offering them a particular kind of arthroplasty. So 40 to 59 years, good functional activity, very good bone stock, a longevity of 25 years, a very low Carlson comorbidity index. Patients are very good with good body reserve, should do a conventional total hip. Of course, these are patients where the patients with who have a high risk for a fixation failure. So not a fixable neck femur will get an arthroplasty, but a neck femur with a high risk of fixation failure will get, can do extremely well with a conventional total hip arthroplasty. Come to the next subset, poor functional activity, not so great bone stock, expected longevity in terms of 10 or 15 years, a Carlson comorbidity index, which is ranging into mild to moderate, variable elements, not so frail, not a clinical community ambulator, these are patients where you play between conventional total hip and a dual mobility total hip, keeping and in offering them a horses for courses and an individualized treatment paradigm. More than 80 years, a different ball game, poor limited mobility, poor bone stock. You're looking at one year, three year follow up. Some of them will go to five years and variable ailments with age, higher comorbidities, not very great body reserves. Definitely hemiarthroplasty, cemented hemiarthroplasty 
bipolar versus unipolar does not make so much of a difference because beyond a certain period in time, the bipolars behave like unipolars. So thank you for your time and a patient hearing. Thank you, Abhay. That was an excellent analysis of the literature and uh, good take-home messages. Uh, well, my question is that, uh, Abhay, uh, should all the unipolars be cemented? Because most of us unipolar in India, we do uncemented, you know, processes. So we are increasingly, that is the case, that we are increasingly moving uh, to uh, uh, a situation where we are happy doing uh, even the cementless uh, unipolars, but the, the play is that systems uh, uh, where, you know, we have good uh, perioperative intensivist, intensivist care, we can manage our bone cement implantation syndrome, we can actually do cemented bipolars. The important thing is not to pressurize the cement and uh, uh, not to go very aggressively with our reaming. The aim is to you know get the best fit uh, uh, implant into this situation and yes there is a place for cementless bipolars but what we don't know is our incidence of periprosthetic fractures uh, with our uh, cementless unipolars and bipolars a question from rakesh yeah hi abhay hi rakesh hi so my question is you know the first group is absolutely fine the last group is absolutely fine the middle group you mentioned about, which is uh, 60 to 79. Right. So in, in your last uh, suggestion, you said that uh, a THR with plus minus a dual mobility is the answer from whatever meta-analysis you said. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, from I did some literature search about a month or two months ago for the same problem because I was debating with somebody. And at that time, you know, I really couldn't find a literature which was strongly in suggestion of a THA. Uh, HEMI is performed because you're looking at a longevity of 15 years here and 15 years the HEMIs are also surviving almost same and the initial comorbidity in HEMIs was shown to be slightly less in the studies which I did. So I'm just asking why are we two looking at two different uh, meta-analysis? Suddenly yeah, why did so, it differ? So, so why we are talking uh, this is essentially that if you look between HEMIs and totals basically the difference in this two subset of population is with the HEMIs you get Arctic acetabular erosions. And sometimes they will sink uh, into the uh, femurs, femur as well, especially the uncemented ones. So this particular subset is answered by a conventional total hip replacement. But the problem with the conventional total hip replacement done for a neck femur with a relative abductor uh, difficulty is that these uh, total hip arthroplasties, despite being done very well, despite having a cup abduction inclination angle to be perfect, still there is something like a functional sagittal index which may not be in place, and they do have a higher dislocation rate as compared to uh, the standard total hip arthroplasties for an ankylos situation. So to answer that particular question, the world is moving a little more towards the benefits of total hip arthroplasty at the same time, minimizing the complications of a conventional total hip arthroplasty, which is a dual mobility uh, total hip arthroplasty. But what we do not know is the real cost benefit and uh, benefit uh, with a dual mobility as compared to a total. And what we do not know is what actually will happen to them, to these dual mobility hips 15, 20, 25 years down the line. So even though we have data for conventional hips, we have data for bipolars and unipolars. So the problem of one is taken away by the other and dual mobility comes in as the natural choice because it takes away the problem of the conventional total hip. But we really don't know what is going to happen 15 years down the line in this subset uh, with the dual mobility. I just want to make okay. one more point regarding the bipolar and unipolar. So I, I think it doesn't matter as long as you have a good quality unipolar. But certainly, I think all of us would agree that when you're putting in the stem and you don't have the big head to actually go with it, your version is very, very much in your control when you put in the stem. Once you put in, you can easily attach the cup. So that's the big advantage I find about the bipolars. The rest, I don't think matters much. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, let's uh, move on to the next question by Dr. Sen, followed by Rajiv. Okay. So my mm -hmm. question is, as uh, I said it out, when we have the larger studies, we probably tend to miss regarding, I'm talking about the cementation, because there will be patients who are risk stratified for SA3 and 4, where the cementation problem will be there. And there will be others where it's not there. 
when we look at the larger data, actually we try to sum up everything. So probably we still lose that sense of uh, care in those patients which are ASA 3 and 4 and diabetic and all those things as compared to others who are not. So probably it, cementation could be good for ASA 1, ASA 2 and general patients. It could give us a poor result in higher group, which probably has not been evaluated in the larger data. You are perfectly right, sir. And that is actually the problem. So the registries, the biggest fault of the registries is they tend to generalize. And the fact that there are such huge volumes in registries is that those outliers where we are worried about and where we want a clear answer, they get their data gets lost in those huge numbers. And to, uh, to be very fair, the registries do not talk much about the subsets that are really a question mark uh, in the uh, in the ball game and those are patients with a high Carlson comorbidity index so those who have more than two or three comorbid factors those who are on the frailer side those who are cancer survivors those who do not have good bone stock those who are uncontrolled rheumatoids uncontrolled diabetics uncontrolled hypothyroids uncontrolled systematic systemic ailments. So we do, the registries do not say anything about that. So registry data mm -hmm. is a generalization of a lot of things and it's Western data, but that's very, very true what you're saying. So we need to individualize and tailor data uh, for cemented and cementless implants based on the patient we have at hand because more comorbidities predisposes to more problems. Mm -hmm. so, and final question from um, Rajiv and then more wide. Uh, a very good explanation, a review of literature, uh, Abhay, uh, an excellent overview by Vikas. Uh, my question to both of you is that the biggest issue is with the patients who are in your first category, the 40 to 59, especially those who have a post recombination or vertical fracture. Uh, it's very difficult to convince these patients to, to a total hip arthroplasty. So in, in your experience, uh, Vikas, uh, uh, practically, uh, what is the practice in, in your setup for these patients? And, and what do you say, Abhay, about the review of literature in this particular group? Um, so can we have Vikas go first and then I can give my Right, my sure. Take? Because this is the group which is the most uh, confusing answer for most of our viewers. Is, is what, what they is should do. Still, or he has, uh, left, I, I think. think I can't see Vikas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Abhay, maybe so you my, can take it my, up. Yeah. My take on this is, sir, that uh, if this patient goes to a trauma surgeon, he gets offered an internal fixation. So we are not talking the uncomplicated ones. We are talking on the uh, fracture neck femurs where there is a high chance of fixation failure. Like you said, posterior combination, verticality of fracture, virus reductions, so 40 percent mm. chances mm. of failure. Now, if this patient goes to a trauma surgeon, simple he will be offered a trauma fixation because the trauma surgeon will say that once this heals, even if it does not heal perfectly, I'll give you 10 years. But what the trauma surgeon does not tell a patient is, when I do an arthroplasty for you here, I give you a 15-year survivorship, a 20-year survivorship, a 25-year survivorship with one operation. So that is not, so it depends upon who the patient goes to and uh, uh, what the practice of the individual team or the system is. So can we Abhay, give the message to our uh, to our viewers and our younger colleagues that when they come across a patient of the uh, combination vertical fracture, uh, we give explanation that uh, there are 40% chances of the failure if the so fixation is done. There is absolute clear evidence to say neck right. femurs in a young adult male in a, a middle-aged patient gets a fixation open reduction mm -hmm. or reduction internal fixation. It is right. only those patients where we start walking into difficult or possible failure situations with poor bone stock, with comorbidities that should offer and uh, offer the patient an arthroplasty option. And that too should be offered by individuals who are good at doing uh, arthroplasty and who will right. use the, the modern technology and the uh, current understanding of how arthroplasty needs to be done. Very right. That's, That's a very good message. Thank you so much. Let's move ahead. Uh, 
due to want of time. Let, uh, let me invite Dr. Anil Omen, who is a professor in orthopedics at uh, Christian Medical College, Bello, to talk us about uh, now planning and implant selection while doing orthoplastic for fracture neck up. Over to Anil, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monty. I hope I'm audible and visible. Yeah. So my talk would be after all the literature review and after all the extensive look we've had at the existing literature, we will talk about planning and implant selection for fracture neck of femur in our situation. So if you look at uh, fracture neck of femur, sorry. Neil, there's some disturbance. I think maybe the fan. No, I don't have a fan running. He's not uh, wearing a hand spray, I think he's talking directly. Okay. It's okay. I think you can go on, Anil. Okay. So, this is a 49 year old male. There's no background noise, also. If, okay. So, this is a 49 year old male, avian with an acute fracture neck of femur. In our planning, obviously, the for the total apathoplasty, an approach won't have a significant issue. Bearing is almost clear and almost well understood and all of us would agree that we would give them the best possible articulation but i think what we need to keep in mind is back to basics the restoration of normal biomechanics and the first step towards planning a total apathroplasty once we've decided is to get a template done and that is very important because that's the first step towards restoring the normal anatomy as well as the normal biomechanics as such now if you look at the offset when you check in this, in the femoral side it's especially, there are two important things that we need to check, especially in the fracture neck of femur, whether it's a high offset or a standard offset. And this definitely points to a high offset and that's what we went ahead to use and that was established. We got the length back, got the offset back and thereby the abductor tension and that will give you the longevity and the patient satisfaction that is desirable in these situations. So templating in these situations are very, very essential and restoration of length and offset is definitely well achieved, well prepared with a pre-op templating. That can be translated to an intra-op templating as well with whatever procedure that we like to use, but we can always measure it with the trials, measure it with a measurement device where we can read the length and the offset once the trials are in place and ensure that the offset is replaced. Now this is possible with the whole set of trials that is available from various implant suppliers and that also translates to the fact that we have to bear in mind that when we change the offset from a normal offset to a standard offset for example across a size there is a significant change in the horizontal offset and that has a significant bearing on the abductor tension which will translate to a better outcome. Now that is also seen in literature that patient individual restoration of the offset is crucial for the good range of movement and a good outcome and thereby it is very very important especially in this subset of patients. One more factor that has to be considered especially when you template for a fracture neck of femur and especially in our scenario is the establer size. In addition to the offset we need to look at the size. When we are touching upon a normal size, a size 52 or 50, we don't have a significant problem. It is an issue that is a small gentleman or a lady more often who has come with a fracture neck of femur who comes to you with a very, very small acetabulum. That is when we got to be adequately prepared because if you do not have a size or do not have an option, especially in the smaller individuals, the smaller, uh, smaller cups where you would definitely still towards doing either a bipolar or either a mobility articulation that would reduce the chance of dislocation you need to be aware of the size itself once we have also templated regarding the size which means the size of the establishment and the offset we need to definitely consider the bone stock whether we are going ahead with the cemented or with the cementless remember the smaller sizes we would plan on the establishment size for a bipolar or a hemi but when you're planning for a cemented or a cementless, we need to ensure a proper fit, also a proper canal assessment so that in the actual door A, we would definitely go ahead with the cemented fixation rather than try an uncemented fixation. Even on the established side, whether it's a cemented or a cementless, we ensure a good fixation, especially in these issues, keeping in mind the basics of establishing the normal inclination and the normal antiversion so that we get a good fixation. The neck osteotomy obviously has to be planned with care and also 
this has to go according to the templated plan and thereby whichever approach is being used we need to have a bearing on the femoral antiversion as well in in uh, in consideration for the fixation whether it's a cemented or cementless we need to check for the size and especially in a cemented we got to check whether there is an adequate cement mantle and avoid a varus positioning especially when you're going with the cemented fixation to prevent early loosening for the cemented fixations especially in the wider canals we have to use a cement restrictor use a gun and as abey mentioned pressurization with monitoring need to check at various stages confirm the length and obviously intraoperative check of the neck length and the offset we have to confirm with the trial reduction before the actual implantation so that especially in a fracture neck of femur for we all are aware that there is a slight increased risk of chance of dislocation and instability we need to be absolutely sure at restoring the length and the offset this is a 35 year old lady a connective tissue disorder again this we opted for a cementless fixation but because of the canal issues because she had definitely there was a problem with the canal on the narrow side it was a stable fixation just a crack but we had to prophylactically wire it to achieve a good fixation with an inter, uh, possible uh, cement uh, cementless fixation another not so uncommon scenario in our situation a 71 year old male post polio residual paralysis with a fracture neck on the right side planning and implant choice this is one situation where you probably go for a dual mobility now in our situation or in our assessment and as per literature the indications for a dual mobility are very very limited you have either compromised adductors or neuromuscular issues now let's see what the literature says about this after what vikas and abey has already alluded to this particular study from the mayo clinic has clearly said that the five year cumulative uh, incidence of any revision obviously comparing to great group uh, two age groups that were similar hip instability was not as common and definitely there are other issues that need to be considered right now which is periprostic fracture and infection this is a study that has just come out of the mayo clinic recently again another study looking at hemi versus total hip arthroplasty the option of choice a dual mobility implant can be used in select situations and a hemi arthroplasty is indicated in patients with poor self sufficiency and physiology is limited and otherwise cemented fixation also is uh, recommended to minimize the risk of periprostatic fractures if you look at the new england journal of medicine which vikas also alluded to this is very clear that total hip arthroplasty versus hemi arthroplasty there was no significant difference considering the fact that the age and the subsets that were compared were similar that is at 24 months again going on to comparison at 5 years again showing the same thing that the hemi arthroplasty and the total arthroplasty in a similar age group did not give a significant difference well what is the verdict out on dual mobility although the dual mobility is technical demand uh, demanding this study from france said that may prevent dislocation while consistently limiting the risk of independence no obvious advantage and a study published in the injury said in the treatment of femoral neck fractures dual mobility cups versus uh, standard total hip uh, arthroplasty especially from the swedish arthroplasty register proves uh, the outcomes proved to be almost similar now if you look at uh, regardless of the surgical approach now you look at this article which is a comparison or an international meta analysis of all the registries and all the data put together a huge volume of data no matter even if they are considered all the registries the proportion of dual mobility uh, khs especially in patients with hip fractures has increased over time but again the indications were not very clear there was a large variation in the number of views however the verdict is that the dual mobility cups were not associated with a reduction in the overall risk of revision surgery so again we are trying to look at the fact that dual mobility may not be the panacea may not be the solution to uh, total hip arthroplasty especially in the physiologically older age group and also has its limited indications so that has to be borne in mind especially with existing literature that has come out so in my message for planning for total hip arthroplasty we need to restore that offset basics risk coming back to basics is very important look at the horizontal offset templating is important 
check interop stability option availability total path replacy like abey said very eloquently in the young 50 to 65 with restoration of basic principles very good bipolars in more than 65 or even 70s especially considering their physiological age not the chronological age association with other comorbidities dual mobility as i say in select patients thank you for your attention thank you thank you anil that was uh, very clear about uh, how to plan your hip and when to do go for a uh, cemented uncemented as well as dual mobility uh, is there any questions uh, yes uh, shubhranshu uh, yeah uh, uh, anil uh, excellent cases uh, now you you showed a very very nice uh, explanation about the uh, templating and we all agree with the with this uh, present time of the uh, digitized uh, uh, digital x rays the templating is is little tough so what are your tricks what are your message for the market i think our solution is very clear we we do not do digital templating even our institution we do not do digital templating it's a very very simple thing we take a standard radiograph we used to do templating with standard conventional x ray machines we don't do that anymore because that's not available it's only digital x rays we get it in the full format we have it on our system so we are able to zoom in and zoom out only thing that you need additional is pre operatively strap a metal ball not a coin because we have also published regarding this a coin causes distortion a metal ball a 3 cm metal ball that is available from the hardware store local hardware store strap it onto the thigh or wherever take an x ray and remember if you look at the bottom of your templates that are provided which are available if you take xerox copies like the older ohp sheets you can put it anywhere and if you zoom in and zoom out on your computer you should be able to match the scale on the template and then read off the size of your establum or the femur very simple very practical very reproducible very nice yeah you do the same please uh, let me ask the for name in your practice which stem size meets most of your cases because what we have got a different stem size uh, stem angles from different companies if you look at our population because i personally find it out it is the high offset stems that meets most of my patients so yes. what is your practice yeah. i agree with you dr ramesh we have now started looking back at our fracture neck of femurs and if you look at it if i may use company names also I find that most of them are high offset. I use a CPT high offset when I need a cemented fixation. I use a Corel high offset when I'm comfortable with the cementless fixation. And the polar stem from the Smith and Nephew has an inherently larger offset. I like that stem as well, especially in a fracture neck of femur. And when we go back and template, we always find that the offset is definitely on the higher offset side. And we keep the trials in position, and we. absolutely are able to assess on the table that the high offset suits the offset the native offset much better sir to answer also, uh, sir to answer your question uh, most of the stems we are getting uh, even the copies of indian make are 135 but if you look at the indian population and there is a data available even from iit pawai that it's 129 degrees that's the average angle at which most of our things so any which comes very close to 129 Will be one of the ideal steps in majority of our population. If you look yeah, at right, the question, we had published yeah, our Ramesh, data Ramesh, regarding the Indian. It is 130 degrees the angle in Indian, even at least in North India. Yeah. So that was the reason. And when you have a 130 degree angle, you can't use 135 to the, I mean, kind of a good uh, template. Uh, I agree, sir. To end yeah. up with 130 steps. So 129, like 130. That's the yes. angle for our population. Yeah. Uh, Rakesh, quick response to your question. If you look at the strikers trials, they have 127 and 132. Right. Okay, and that's very, very because that's a, translating to the standard offset and the high offset. Use those trials; that will be very good. It's it's in tune with what you said. Uh, very right, Anil. One last comment uh, that uh, you're right that with the use of the large diameter heads, the need of the dual mobility is actually not not so much. No, no, yeah. I. I wouldn't recommend dual mobility as a panacea, and definitely literature also supports that. And I think more important than that, restoration of the offset and restoration of the neck length. I think that will do the job. Dual right. mobility has its select indications, and I think we have seen literature also to support that. Finally, finally, Dr. Ajit Kumar question. Then uh, I will move on to my lecture. Yeah. yeah. Just about this uh, 
high offset and low offset. South India, I think, what we published was about 127 degrees. That's we got in our study. More for them, more importantly, in these uh, osteomalacia patients with Paksa Bhaiyana, um, I find it very difficult to get the appropriate size uh, implants. What's your uh, experience and what do you do about it? Yeah, we, we always, for the smaller ones, I use the uh, Zimmer or the, the, in fact, it's a struggle to get even the smallest size in in some people. The Smith That's right, yeah. Yes, zero. Sometimes it's a struggle to get in, but I gently broach it and get it in because that has a good, the CPT, unfortunately, the supply chain is not good from Zimmer. That's right, yeah. But, but they have a good standard and a high offset. They have the extra small, small, and then coming on to the next size. That's a very, very user-friendly uh, right. But unfortunately, our supply chain is not so good. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next lecture. Uh, Anil, could you mute yourself? Yeah. I'll just share my screen. There is a question, is there any need to include the head size to be used in THA while preparing your template? Anil, could you quickly answer that and then we'll move ahead. Yeah, as we discussed that, I'll answer that. Uh, as we discussed that uh, head size usually depends upon the cop size. And if your cop size is more than 52, then you can put a 36 size head and uh, if it is uh, 48 or 50, then you can use 32 and less than 46, you can use say 28. So, but in fraction neck femur case, try to use uh, as big as the head possible. Okay, now I'll uh, tell you about the intraoperative tips and tricks about the, while doing orthoplasty or fraction neck femur, I'll show a five minutes video first, followed by a couple of slides for discussion sake. So this is orthoplast fracture neck femur. I usually preserve the bursa, greater trochanteric bursa for future closure. And this is the attachment of the gluteus maximus. I keep it intact. I never release it in fracture neck femur cases. Then I take the you know, capsule and rotators and put a stay suture there for future closure. Then you deliver the head. Now head size, uh, you measure to give you an idea about the what is the size of your cup or acetabulum, then you expose the acetabulum. This is the anterior spike or anterior retractor. Next, uh, you put a Stinman pin posteriorly and put an inferior spike there. So that gives you a complete circumferential exposure of the acetabulum. So this is a Stinman pin and inferior spike. That is the transverse acetabular ligament, which will aid in the placement of the cup. I take out the you know ligamentum teres, which is usually present and medial fat pad, which is there. So after cleaning that, you reach the floor of the acetabulum there. Next, you have to take out the cartilage. The cartilage, normally I first do the gousing of the cartilage before putting the rimmers in, so that make it rough. Then I put the rimmer and first rim it vertically in order to reach the floor of the acetabulum, then give desired degree of inclination and burden. And while rimming, one has to be careful because sometimes there may be soft bones and you may bowl at the medial wall. Then I put the trial cup in and after putting the trial cup in with a desired degree of inclination and the version, I mark on the skin and uh, that gives me an idea while putting the final cup, I have to keep uh, the same degree of inclination and the version. So that is a marking which is there on the skin. Next, I take the final cup. In this case, it is a 46 size cup, which is a multiple cup and check it the stability anteroposteriorly, superinferiorly as well as rotationally. If it is stable in all the three directions, I don't put screws. I put a trial liner at this point of time. Next, expose the femur. Take two spikes at right angles to each other. <clears throat> then the position of the leg is a guide for the version. Next, take out the overhanging bone from the you know, medial side of the greater trochanter with a gauze in order to find the canal. Usually, this is the piriform fossa where you are entering the canal. Take out that bit of bone. Then take the you know, straight trimmer in order to find the canal. And uh, while you put the straight trimmer in, that time you should put the other hand on the shaft itself so that that will guide you that where you are entering. So when you enter the canal, you see the marrow material is coming out. 
and next you put the brows while taking out this you know straight rimmer then just rim little bit entirely so that that will give you rise to some degree of version next you put the brooch in once the brooch is stable actually as well as rotationally then do the trial reduction measure the vertical offset and the horizontal offset putting the trial head in and do a trial reduction so during the trial reduction you check the position this is flexion abduction external rotation to see the stability and there is no impingement posteriorly next to abduct the hip to look for the impingement superiorly of the greater trochanter along the you know, pelvis next i extend the hip see that it is just coming to the neutral and uh, next you do the you know combined antiversion coplanar test in about to say 30 to 40 degree of abduction, 30 to 40 degree of internal rotation that uh, both the liner and the head remain coplanar there. So this is uh, the coplanar test of combined antiversion both on the femoral and acetabular side. Next, I check for the you know, shock test. As you can see here, little bit more you know, play between the acetabular and the head. This is the overst test to check for the you know, tightness of the tensor fascia lata. Next, I do flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. As you can see, it is dislocated in about 70 degree of internal rotation. Since there is a play, so I used the you know, elevated polyethylene liner there. Next, I put the stem in and give a couple of you know, blows with the hand. So about uh, one inch of stem, which is projecting, which needs hammering. And finally, I put the trial head in and again measure the vertical offset and horizontal offset in order to restore that. And again, you can do a trial reduction at this stage to check for all these tests which we did uh, before putting the you know stem in next we clean the tronion properly and uh, here i put a ceramic head there so this is ceramic on polyethylene bearing surface this is through posterior approach give couple of blows through the ceramic head and next uh, i reduce the hip so that is after reduction then this test which has, which has been put uh, in the you know, rotators and the capsule, pull through sutures to the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter and pull these sutures through that and uh, with a little flexion and external rotation, close it. This is the abductor rotator interval superiorly. So we close the abductor rotator interval. So we do a good uh, you know, repair of the structures. This is the you know, greater trochanter bursa, which is closed, which looks more anatomical. While closing the D fossa, I take care not to take sutures through the muscle. I take it through the fossa superficially, only close the fossa and keep the muscle intact. So indications for totally preplacement in uh, you know, fracture neck femur is the independent mobile patient without any cognitive impairment. And these are the special conditions like chronic renal failure, inflammatory arthritis, maybe hepatic failure patients as always showed, steroid use, osteoporosis, and is there any pathological fracture? These are the cases we need to do a totally replacement uh, for fresh fracture neck femur. Now, points to consider here that the higher rate of wear and loosening, higher rate of dislocation, and uh, bone stock, one should look for the leave length inequality and, of course, the infection. So, higher rate of dislocation because there are lax and torn soft tissues, no fibrous uh, tissue due to arthritis, so that you can release. So, do a minimum release as far as possible and full range of motion is there preoperatively. Those, these patients postoperatively also try to, uh, you know, go to full range of movement and there's a high activity level because of normal situation. So as Anil told you, restore the horizontal offset, restore the, you know, vertical offset as well as the anterior offset or what is known as anti-version, you know, meticulously you have to restore this. And uh, that is after the surgery, that is how does it look like. There's a higher rate of dislocation to prevent that, you know, your orientation of the component is extremely important. The version has to be maintained, the angle of combined antiversion, uh, especially through a posterior approach, reconstruct the offset accurately and use larger heads. And uh, there is leads to lesser dislocation rate because there's a greater range of movement before impingement and greater jump distance. And of course, the meticulous repair of the soft tissues, as I showed you, the rotators and the capsule has to be meticulously repaired posteriorly. This is the literature dislocation of totally preparation in patient with fracture of femoral in the neck. It has been shown that overall dislocation rate is high, 6% compared to other uh, totally preparation due to other causes. 
and posterior lateral approach has got increased risk of dislocation. Hence, it is recommended that you should use an anterolateral approach if possible for you know, fracture neck femur patients. And this is with or without repair of the posterior capsular that uh, the rate of dislocation that uh, without repair is almost 10 times more compared to if you're not repairing the posterior capsules, capsular structures. And the dislocation rate with anterolateral, direct lateral, and posterior approach, the soft tissue with soft tissue repair is 0 0.7, 0 0.43, and 1.01 percent. Mm -hmm. That means you know, posterior approach with soft tissue repair even has got a higher dislocation, dislocation rate compared to anterolateral and direct lateral approaches. The limb length inequality, one has to prevent it. That minimal soft tissue release for exposure do not release the you know reflected head of rectus femoris, which is attached as a supraostabular margin which sometimes we do for the arthritic hips for exposure of the SWM and do not release the gluteus maximus attachment to the posterolateral aspect of the femur because that may lead to increased limb length discrepancy because too much release may lead to laxity and you will be forced to select long neck for stability that will lead to limb length discrepancy. And of course, we discussed about high offset stems in the previous lecture. So can we have the advantage for, as far as for TA, Advantage of total hip replacement as regards less reoperation rates and advantage of bipolar as regards less dislocation and probably dual mobility is the answer. And uh, this literature shows that there is a least uh, lowest rate of dislocation in dual mobility compared to big head total hip replacement, constant liners total hip replacement, and single mobility standard total hip replacement. The dual mobility has got a least dislocation rate. So conclusion one, hip arthroplasty is a viable option for active, young, and elderly patient with displaced femoral neck fractures with a favorable outcome. Watch for dislocation, limb length discrepancy, and infection. Good surgical technique and planning is the key. Second conclusion, bipolar or total hip replacement. Bipolar is preferred in patients more than 75 years with a sedentary life. It's a less invasive and quick procedure. You can do cemented or cemented depending upon the bone quality. And there is a theoretical possibility of future conversion to total hip replacement without revising the stem. Whereas total hip is preferred less than 75 years, physiologically active patient with any pre-existing arthritis, and it has got more predictable pain relief compared to bipolar and better functional outcome compared to bipolar, and again cemented or cemented depending upon the bone quality and the etiology. Third conclusion, if you are considering total hip arthroplasty, consider anterolateral approach, which is better. Selective use of larger head, dual mobility hips, and there is improved functional hip scores in total hip arthroplasty, and there are lower reoperation rates than hemiarthroplasty. There is higher dislocation rates compared to hemiarthroplasty to a certain extent, and of course, you have to take care of the limb length discrepancy, which we'll discuss in detail by Dr. Rajkumar in the next lecture. This is a 102 years old male with fractured neck femur, where we did a cemented type of total hip arthroplasty, and that is uh, almost you know, four years follow-up of this patient before he died due to some cardiac causes. I thank you for a patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, now, if there is no other question in the interest of time, uh, we'll go on to the next talk of Dr. Rajkumar. And maybe some questions from Shubranchu also can be asked after the Dr. Rajkumar's talk. Uh, Rajkumar will be speaking on uh, handling complications after total hip arthroplasty, especially limb length discrepancy. Yeah. Uh, can I start? Uh, thank yes, you, Dr. Yes, Rajkumar. Rajkumar. Thank, thank you, you. Dr. Mohanty, and thank you, President. Good evening to everybody. So, now I share the screen. Okay. Right. Handling uh, limb length uh, discrepancy after total hip replacement in a neck of femur fracture. So, uh, all this while we were um, discussing about uh, when to do a THR and when to do a bipolar, what is the ideal treatment for a neck of femur fracture? This is always a debatable question. What is the right choice of uh, treatment for a neck of femur fracture, whether to fix it or whether to replace it? But when we do a replacement, when we do a neck of femur fracture, uh, uh, or a, a totally replacement for a neck of femur fracture, and if limb length discrepancy happens, then it becomes very hard to handle it. Why? Many a times the patient may not uh, notice it, patient may not ask us, but many a times if the patient or the attender starts asking, then it is the surgeon puts, uh, it puts the surgeon in a backseat, what exactly to, because it confuses the surgeon what to do, whether to intervene 
or what to do. So if you look at the successful hip replacement outcome, it is the offset and the limb length are the relevant predictors. Why it is that the offset and the limb length goes hand in hand, which was very much elaborated in the previous talks that if you get the offset correct, then the stability is achieved. And if, uh, if the stability is achieved in a hip replacement, then obviously the surgeon doesn't need to lengthen the limb in the fear because of a risk factor for dislocation. So offset and limb length, if we achieve these two, I think then the uh, hip replacement is regarded as a successful procedure. So not many literature is, uh, data is available, particularly in a neck of femur fracture THR, if it is done, what happens to the limb length this can say how to do. So in this literature, in this study, when they mentioned about templating of total hip replacement for femoral neck fractures, all the other data, all the other studies which have them compared is for non-neck of femur fractures. But one study, particularly this study, when they have analyzed, they have analyzed and they have concluded that limb length discrepancy is more when you do a DHR without templating. Having said that, it is not easy to do a tem uh, templating for a neck of femur fracture, particularly in a trauma situation. But still, if you do it properly, then the chance of limb length discrepancy is very less. So to understand that, why limb length discrepancy happens in THR done for particularly for a neck of femur fracture. So if you look at the Australian Joint Registry, they have studied the risk factors for revision for early dislocation. The very important point here is that early dislocation in THR and in that they have mentioned and it has been significantly um, uh, proved that it is the fracture neck of femur which has got a very high risk for dislocation. So THR in neck of femur fracture has got a high risk for dislocation. That is what they have studied. And Skalko et al in his article in 2016 also, he has mentioned that patients at risk for dislocation. He has elaborated that female patients, obesity and neuromuscular problems, hyperlaxity, alcoholism, all these things are all for high risk for dislocation in the early post-operative period. And in that comes the neck of femur fracture as well. So this group has got a high chance for LLD. Why is that? The surgeon again lengthens the limb to avoid dislocation. So these are the set of patients who are at high risk for dislocation. So if you look at this, this risk factor and the fear factor combines together and puts the surgeon and makes the surgeon to lengthen the limb in total hip replacement, particularly for neck of femur fracture. So the surgeon is the one who has to be very careful and uh, try to avoid it rather than try to manage it. So when, when we come to the limb length discrepancy, we have to understand that it has got two components. One is, it's even though it looks very basic, but we have to understand that it is a true length, leg length inequality, or it is the anatomical. The true leg length inequality is the anatomical one. And the apparent or the functional leg length inequality is the uh, is the functional one. Like the apparent one is more of a functional, whereas the true leg length inequality is more of an anatomical. So in neck of femur fractures, uh, when we do a THR, it is the true leg length which happens many a times. But still, we have to understand that it also there is a chance for a apparent or a functional leg, leg, leg length inequality. Why that happens? We will look into that. So obviously, everybody will know this that the true length is measured from the ASI to the medial malleolus and that gives your uh, anatomical leg length. And this anatomical or a true leg length inequality is caused by the surgeon by making the limb lengthened by doing the uh, lengthening of the prosthetic head neck distance. So it is basically when you increase the uh, head neck, uh, that is the neck length, if you keep on increasing, obviously the lengthening happens. Even though the stability is also increasing, the lengthening is the one which happens predominantly. So this point, we have to be very, very careful and understand. So whereas if it is an apparent limb length discrepancy, mainly it is a functional part. And the factors that contribute to this apparent limb length discrepancy are the pelvic obliquity for various other reasons. And then the degenerative changes or the scoliosis, all the changes in the spine, obviously will give an apparent limb length discrepancy and also the soft tissue contracture. So the soft tissue contractures can be ipsilateral or in the uh, contralateral or in the spine. So whatever it is, all these factors will contribute to the apparent limb length discrepancy. So clinically, what happens when the limb is lengthened? Many a times patient may not have much of 
symptoms. But if the patient is having symptoms, it will mainly pain. And also uh, flex knee syndrome has been reported. What is that? When the patient is always keep trying to uh, flex the knee and walk to avoid the difficulty of the lengthening. So that is called as the flex knee syndrome. Then comes the symptoms. That is the instability or a history of dislocation, particularly due to uh, the lengthening because of the component orient malposition. So not only the uh, other uh, soft tissue problems, the component malposition also will ca cause the limb length. So that also has to be considered as a symptom. And then the another symptom is the stretching of nerves around the hip, particularly sciatic nerve. So all these things, whenever you see uh, from a patient post-operatively, you have to consider limb length discrepancy. And it has been it can be classified as non-correctable and correctable. Let us see first the non-correctable limb length discrepancy. Why is it called as non-correctable? Because the problem is somewhere away from the operated hip, like the spinal deformity, contralateral hip arthritis, and also sometimes pre-existing shortening of the femur and tibia for various other problems like a malunion or non-union like that. And then pre-existing limb length discrepancy with the operative side longer than before the THR. So all these, how will you understand, how will you uh, diagnose it? Thorough physical exam. Even though it is a trauma patient, even though it is an acute neck of femur fracture, we should not do the treatment just by uh, looking at the x-ray. So we should make sure that we are uh, examining the patient thoroughly and also make sure taking all the proper x-rays. Now comes to the correctable limb length discrepancy. Majority of the time in a neck of femur fractures, if you do a THR, this is the one which we'll encounter. So what are the three components in this? Initially, post, initial post-operative apparent limb length discrepancy, then the component problems, then the soft tissue tension problem. These are the three components which comes under this correctable limb length discrepancy. So what is this initial post-operative apparent limb length discrepancy? This, even it, it can happen whether in an elective THR or in an acute uh, THR for a neck of femur fracture. If the patient has got a periarticular muscle spasm, uh, lumbosacral scoliosis or a pelvic mobility, which I told that it has to be examined even though it is a neck of femur fracture. With all these things, the patient can produce a early post-operative limb length discrepancy even in a neck of femur fractures. So what happens with, the, with this? It is very simple that everybody will know that the pelvic gets tilted towards the operated side and the opposite side, contralateral side is pushed uh, superiorly. If the pelvis is uh, lifted superiorly. So because of that, the operated side apparently becomes lengthened, even though the anatomically the A size is at the same level, because of the apparent pelvic tilt, the operated side becomes lengthened. So this is called as the initial post-operative apparent limb length discrepancy. Look at this example, 65-year-old male, neck of femur fracture underwent a hip replacement. This is the immediate post-operative x-ray where it shows there is an apparent lengthening on the right side, operated side, and there is a pelvic tilt. And the same patient, three months post-operative x-ray shows that almost the pelvic obliquity is corrected and there is no limb length discrepancy. So this is called as the initial post-operative apparent limb length discrepancy, which doesn't need anything. So we should not get alarmed by seeing the immediate post-operative x-ray. So one more example, look at this case, again a 65, 69-year-old female, neck of femur fracture, immediate post-operative x-ray shows a 5 millimeter lengthening with some pelvic apparent limb lengthening. And four months later, this has corrected to less than 2 mm, so which is negligible. So in a neck of femur fracture, 2 mm or a 1 mm is very much acceptable post-operatively. So this is how over the period of time, three months, six months, the patient apparent limb length gets corrected. So this is all called as initial post-operative apparent limb length discrepancy. So what happens in this paper, Ranavat has said that in total hip replacement, when you're doing for a neck of femur fracture, a small increase in the neck length may help with stability. Yes, we all discussed about instability post neck of femur fracture THR. Laxity is there, soft tissue because of trauma. So you can have an increase in length very minimally, but however, any every uh, however the lengthening should not happen more than 10 mm and also in various other literature it has been said that anything less than 10 mm that is a one centimeter or less than one centimeter of lengthening can be accepted so we need not do anything so that means management part is not needed for anything is not needed if it is less than 10 mm so initial post-operative apparent limb length discrepancy is found almost approximately 14% of hip replacement. But look at this, 14% is not purely for neck of femur fractures. 
for all THR. So that part we have to understand that it is not purely for neck of femur fractures alone. And in that 14%, 0.5% almost persist for a long period of time. So what is the treatment for this post immediate uh, post-operative apparent LLD? That is, we have to educate the patient, reassure them, talk to the attenders, tell them that this will correct over the period of time, physical therapy, and possibly a temporary shoe lift. So all these non-operative managements will most of the time, majority of the time, will solve the problem if it is not anatomically lengthened grossly more than 10 mm. So most cases resolve within six months from surgery. So what is that? The, it is the perception of the limb length we have to diagnose, whether it is really anatomical or it is the perception of the patient that their patient has got a LLD. So we have to understand if it is a perception of LLD, which is very common, majority of the time it resolves over the period of time. So uh, the, the, the whole idea is uh, the conservative management, particularly for four to six months, if it is not really more than like 20 mm, 15 mm, 20 mm, it is not more than that, like you can wait for some time. And if patients doesn't improve and they become symptomatic, then we have to look at doing intervening surgically. So same time, you have. if we are intervening uh, surgically, then you have to correct any anatomical problem is there with the component. So that is what is most important in the management part. So uh, Dr. Anil very clearly mentioned about the soft tissue offset and everything. So any THR for a good result, you have to get a good abductor tension, reduce joint reaction force, good horizontal offset and correct placement of the components to achieve the correct center of rotation this is our aim so if we achieve that we will not have any problem with the limb length or limb length, limb length or instability so femoral offset again which was uh, very clearly explained it plays a very important role and if you want to increase the femoral uh, if we increase the femoral offset definitely the joint reaction force and the impingement uh, is reduced and it will also increase the soft, ten soft tissue tension without increasing the leg length so for young surgeons you have to understand by increasing the femoral offset, the leg length will not increase in a big way, but it increases the soft tissue tension, which will prevent limb length discrepancy. So if you decrease the femoral offset, then it becomes instability, abductor weakness, then lurch, all those problems come. So femoral offset plays a very crucial role. We have to keep it in mind if you are planning to manage the limb length discrepancy. That is the most important point. So again, one uh, this is an example. Again, this, this was talked about the high half, eye offset implant was very much discussed previously. This is an example, neck of femur fractures. You can use an high offset stem. Uh, this is a four years post-operative uh, uh, follow-up x-ray showing a very good result. So the key point here is definitely, yes, in a neck of femur fracture, you can use an high offset stem, but only key point here is that it should not be excessively lateralized. So that means what? You cannot lateralize the cup and then lateralize the stem also. So that means you are stretching that uh, soft tissue too much on the lateral side, which will cause pain and also uh, that is also a cause for failure of the stem as well. So you can use an eye offset stem, but only to the level of need. So you have to use it appropriately. So for that, you need to do a template and make sure you are using it judicially. So coming to the operative treatment. So patients who require revision THR for their limb length discrepancy, who are those patients? Persistent instability, functional impairment. We have to clearly understand which patient has got the functional impairment. You have to make the surgical option as a last resort, provided if there is no much of anatomical problem, failure of conservative or non-operative measures. These three things are there, then you can think about doing the uh, uh, revision THR for a limb length discrepancy. So why this happens and when you need to intervene, look at this x-ray. The problems here is predominantly on the ostabulum side. What is that? The cup is too much lateralized. Cup is huge. It is inferiorly placed. And because of that, definitely your center of rotation is altered. So the stability is compromised. So all these things happens and then surgeon what happens he to get a good stability he will try to lengthen this so when this is the situation definitely the patient is not going to improve so this is ideal situation where you need to intervene and change the component so this is the most important thing so what is the right placement of the cup right version all these small small things also contribute to the stability which uh, in uh, in turn makes the surgeon to lengthen the limb so this one more example here, look at this, this patient again, neck of femur fracture, THR, 
underwent. So three months also later, the patient has not corrected. So it's like borderline 10, 11 mm is there, not much of correction. But if you look at the cup, cup is little vertical, it is little inferiorly placed. If this patient is not symptomatic, then you, um, you can try uh, uh, opposite side uh, heel rise and uh, try to avoid the revision surgery, which is a huge thing. But if the patient is symptomatic, then you have to think about considering the components change, uh, positioning, change of positions. So if symptomatic limb length deficiency is there, even after conservative, then the treatment should be revision. So to conclude, we have to fi find out where exactly the problem is, whether it is functional or anatomical. So patients with the true leg length different, uh, limb length discrepancy are often asymptomatic. And if it is asymptomatic, then we have to consider, try all the other measures. If symptomatic leg length inequality, uh, shoes rise on the opposite side will help. And over the period of time, it might get corrected to a certain extent. But if more limb length discrepancy is there, then you have to think about revision surgery. But in the neck of femur fracture, limb length discrepancy, if you are trying to do a revision surgery, and you want to correct the limb length, be careful that if you're trying to shorten it by changing the femoral component, changing the offset, all those things, post-operative instability can happen. So you have to be very, very careful when you're doing a revision surgery and you have to talk to the patient in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Rajkumar. Uh, while uh, next speaker, Dr. Minal is sharing his skin, we can take one question. Uh, uh, what kind of revision surgery, Rajkumar, suppose there is a patient of more than 10 millimeter of limb length disturbance, you do offer a revision surgery and what kind of, have you done any no. time? A no, uh, surgery? that's a good question. Have you done any time? No, I have not done till now. The, the thing is, till 20 mm also we can accept, uh, Dr. Mohanty, because 2 centimeter till 2 centimeter, okay. But anything more than that, it is very, very, very obvious and very bad. But uh, I don't think in this current scenario with so much of training and uh, so much of modularity available with the implants, anything more than two uh, centimeters will not happen at all if I, if I am correct. So try yeah. to avoid the revision surgery only for limb length discrepancy because it's quite a major surgery. We have to change almost all the components. So better uh, to avoid. One, uh, one emphasis Rajkumar we can give here is that mm -hmm. intraoperative measurement uh, is very that is, that is that is what the next question actually yeah. how to yeah. check yeah, for intraoperative limb length discrepancy just tell your method of uh, intraoperative no, um, limb length discrepancy so one thing one thing when we are doing for a neck of femur fractures we have to be uh, we have to understand that soft tissue laxity is there so we should not rely on the chuck test at all so the most yeah. important point here is i always uh, follow is your clinically i check the le leg length that is one second thing is on all range of motions, if there is no dislocation, you have to accept it that you should not rely on your check test, particularly in a neck of femur fractures, particularly in a female patient. So don't rely on the check test, first point. Second thing is um, make sure that you are getting your femoral offset correct. So that will help you and also the cup placement. So if you have any uh, doubt before putting the original cup, check under the CM, particularly in a neck of femur situation, whether you have placed the cup the correct placement of the cup and correct placement of the stem will solve the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Rajkumar. Let us uh, move ahead with uh, Nrinal's talk on the totally pathoplasty as is always for failed fixation. Nrinal. Thank you, Dr. Mohanty and uh, IA for giving me the opportunity. I'll be talking about conversion totally pathoplasty or salvage for failed fixations after fracture neck of femur. So why usually we use the convoluted screws and why do they fail? Common cause is inadequate reduction, which we see. The wrong screw placement, which usually is recommended to be an inverted triangle. The poor bone quality and the faulty protocol being followed by the patients, the bones being osteoporotic. They do early foot weight bearing. They do squat and sit cross leg before they are being told to. The inverted triangle configuration has been shown to be having the best cutout strength. And uh, it shows that the screw failure is least if they are put in an inverted triangle with the inferior screw going in the calcar. So that's very important. If you put any other configuration, they're bound to fail. Uh, and then you would require a conversion total hepatoplasty for the failed fixations for you know addressing the non-unions, the malunion screw cutouts, AVNs, secondary OA, and infection as well. So a lot of complications are seen in literature uh, regarding internal fixation and the failure. And non-unions up to 10 to 33 percent had reported by Parker et al. And it depends upon the initial displacement of the fracture, the quality of reduction 
and with the increasing patient age, you know, all these correlate with a lot of chances of non-union. Avascular necrosis has been reported up to 10 to 20 percent in the literature. The age at the time of presentation, um, higher the age, higher the failure rate. Posterior combination, the degree of displacement, the verticality of the fracture, the quality of reduction, and these all would uh, contribute to AVN if not properly fixed and eventually ending up into secondary OA implant failure. Reoperation rates of up to 38% for displaced fracture neck of femur have been reported in literature. I will not go into the details of the literature. All of all this has been discussed. Let us see how the, uh, the natural history of a fixation progresses. So this is a patient who was operated for neck of femur in November 2015. And we see that, uh, you know, the offset has probably not been maintained. There is combination at the neck and there is a collapse in the initial reduction as well. One of the screws is already going into the posterior aspect. And by January 2016, when you find that, okay, probably it might be starting to unite. And in March of the same year, you find that it's going into a virus and a collapse is going to occur. August 2017, the patient develops a screw cutout and implant failure. And you can see that the fracture is not united, progressing on to osteoarthritis and secondary avian and secondary osteoarthritis, as we see. So such a case, when you approach such a case, you already know that obviously, uh, you need to rule out infection. So it's very important that even if your parameters of CDC, ESR, CRP are normal, I would still do an aspirate. Uh, Harding approach has already been uh, told in the literature that it gives the best uh, dislocation rates, inferior rates with the Harding approach. And when you have to uh, do a total hip, you must dislocate and remove the screws. So you can do them either after you've dislocated the head and then uh, gradually pull them out with the uh, screws and the different screw, um, you know, screw types like the star and the large diameter heads available for you. Or if they are fixed, you know, you can actually hammer them from the from the femoral head back. So that is one of the tips to do a total hip in such situation. Uh, you will obviously have to burn the sclerotic screw tracks because if you don't do that, you will end up in putting the stem in whereas, which is actually going to be a problem and as a recipe for failure. Prophylactic cables and wires should be used before the lesser trochanter, especially if your inferior cannulator screw is entering below the level of the lesser trochanter. So these are the basic tips that you need to know when you do a total hip arthroplasty in failed fixations. And this is an example. You can see a total hip arthroplasty being done in the same patient, which we were following now. And you can see the sclerotic screw tracks where the stem has been placed in the correct version after the screw, tracks were, uh, screw heads were burned. And this is the two and a half, three years follow-up of the same patient. And you can see the function absolutely perfect function the patient has and the long-term follow-up in December 2020-20. This is the latest x-rays. Another patient failed CCS, but here you see the screws are broken. So again, you do, she came with a painful lurch shortening, the uh, ESR, CRP, all normal. You do the CT and you see that it's a non-union, which would be need, needing conversion to a total hepatoplasty. Again, the same tips and pearls, rule out infection, aspirate, remove broken screws. You should know the make, the broken fragment set should be available. You should know, have all the star shaped or the larger screw divers. Again, in this case, you might not be able to dislocate. So remove the broken screws first um, and then, you know, uh, remove the, re the uh, residual screws from the head and you revise the cut, extract the head, plug the screw holes with bone graft if you're using a cemented stem. So a lot of complications have been reported in literature after uh, total hepatoplasty for fracture neck of femur after failed fixation. Uh, dislocation rates of up to 9% have been reported. And some series by Archibald et al. have reported dislocations up to 4.9%. So dislocation is a very common complication once you do a total of arthroplasty after failed fixation of neck of femur. Infection is the second most complication where you see a deep infection rate of up to 3.8% uh, reported by Melhoff and 4.7% by Agarwal et al. when you study from the Indian scenario. Uh, Dr. Mohanty himself has published outcomes of total of arthroplasty for salvage for failed internal fixation in Indian Journal of Orthopedics. And he said that the two, he used two-stage approach in 19 out of 20 failed fixations with impaired function and increased mortality up to 10% in these scenarios. Outcomes after total have arthroplasty. This is a study by Bartels et al. That when you, when you study internal fixation with total have arthroplasty, this has already been discussed in context to the neck of femur, but not after failed fixations, which I am discussing here, that if you do internal fixation, you know, you would have, um, you know, a lot of failure rates, but there is a better satisfaction, less pain scores, less reoperation, and less complication in the total hip arthroplasty group. So obviously for these patients, it is better that we do a total hip arthroplasty. Another study, 102 patients, 
you know, the rate of revision procedure was just 4% in total hepatoplasty as compared to 42% in the open reduction internal fixation group. So the THR group was always better in regards to movement, pain, and quality of life. So all these studies have been discussed. Take home message, I would say, is conversion total hepatoplasty is challenging. You must always rule out infection by aspiration. You must have all the armamentarium like broken fragment cells, screwdrivers in the inventory, and a high-speed bird to clear the sclerotic screw tracts. High dislocation infection rates usually are reported and consider using large diameter heads or a dual mobility if you have abductor insufficiency. Infection needs to be treated in a two-stage always. And total hepatoplasty gives best functional outcomes as compared to internal fixation in the age group of 50 to 70 years. And thank you. Thank you, Mrinal. That was an excellent uh, exposition about how to go about uh, the total hip after appeal fixation. We'll go ahead with Dr. Sen's lecture, then we'll have uh, questions at the end. Uh, Dr. Sen, please, he'll talk us about uh, how to go about a hemiarthroplasty, you know, tips and tricks in a fracture neck femur, which I most of us do. Is, uh, visible? Yeah. Okay. So, talking about some things about a very standard procedure. First thing, when the patient is admitted, the first question which is useful is, whether we give a preoperative traction or not. The literature is clear that a pillow under the affected limb seems to be the most effective measure to provide a comfort to these patients rather than giving a traction. That's the first point we encounter. Second point, pre-op analgesia to the patient whenever we have got that patient with us. It is expected that a nerve block given by the anesthetist who is involved in the management of that patient, which is to be done in the next uh, 24 to 36 hours, must be there and a proper block should be given. And what is the ideal time? Obviously, as we understand, at the earliest possible. If patient is a 7 and 2, within 12 hours to 48 hours, depending upon the time interval from the patient's home to the hospital and the hospital, the preoperative workup. This is also seen that if the patient has comorbidities which are correctable and it will take two to three, four days more, it's better to wait for, get them corrected and then do it. That's a very important point, if it is correctable. And what has been seen that if these are not correctable, then the mortality of delaying is also very high. And next is multidisciplinary care has to be done. And the indications as per the anesthesia guidelines in 2001, because there are now 2020 guidelines also, but these guidelines, they quote for these guidelines only, are these guidelines that there is something which is to be done to delay surgery, to do something which include a proper uh, sodium or potassium concentration, diabetes, it is totally uncontrolled, ventricular failure, correct cardiac arrhythmia, chest infection, and this thing. Choice of anesthesia, again, the literature as far as the guideline now is, doesn't matter. Patient is better to be offered a choice after discussions and uh, after giving an adequate care about it. If the patient at that stage is anemic, define it out, whether it is, uh, what is the level of hemoglobin, if it is less than seven, if it is more than seven, obviously you can proceed with the surgery and give subsequent uh, infusion or iron and something. If it is less, definitely transfuse first and then take care of it. So pre-surgical anesthesia is to be taken care of. Which approach? We have differed in many approaches. As a general, this thing, either posterior or later approach has been most often, but posterior excess route is the oldest and has been most used. There is no technically difference between little and posterior. The posterior surgical approach is because it's the most common. We do it from that the posterior side position. You definitely a little position with the hip area marked around a limb free to rotate. And now it's very important that our incision must be focused upon to give us appropriate access. Because in hemiarthroplasty, we are not looking at the two sides to be that an exposure, so it should not be too much. Now, another question comes, we can incise properly the trochanteric bursa because we may be repairing it because it is also a practice which varies from individual to individual. But if we are to repair it out, it's better to have a proper incision, a proper cutting through the incision. Now, 
people have got different approaches we were used to condition like a above the piriformis then we came below the piriformis for hemiarthroplasties and now people have come down to the below the obturator internus also so the way we are trained in the way we do it we can have that very window the literature says that if we are below the obturator internus that gives us maximum security from the dislocation point of view in addition to uh, these things also though subsequent capsular repair and a capsular release properly and proper repair is supposed to be the single most factor which has helped in reduction of the dislocations or instability in posterior approach otherwise posterior approach as all of us had a higher rate of dislocation another important factor is the labrum keeping the labrum properly intact finding the difference between capsule and labrum saving it because you know the final bipolar prosthesis has to fit in as a kind of a negative pressure so it is very important that negative pressure is maintained with the labrum all around it then our subsequent care is likely to be subsequent outcome is likely to be much better as far as stability is concerned so for that uh, taking care of the labrum we have to be very careful to have an appropriate access we take the sutures we have taken that suture out doing get the neck out once the neck is out we go further for the proper osteotomy across as we have already seen in previous uh, steps also once it is done again emphasizing upon the point of the labrum we have a appropriate perception again and then we take out the head the head must be technically rotated within because if we rotate the head within we are likely to break the uh, ligament inside and then its removal is from the inferior side that's very important if we remove it from the inferior side it does not break it doesn't cause a break into the any other wall also the labrum is also taken care of so that removal from the inferior side is the most important step obviously we have already uh, taken care that we must have a proper sizing because if it is small it will not have a proper co uh, coverage and in the end it is too large there could be instability also there could be problem also then with that care in the estabulum we have to remove the pulvinar tissue carefully with the cautery whatever we do once it is done then we come to the uh, the femur side as has been said earlier also going with the lateralized area in the piriformis fossa so that we don't get into varus going with the taper femur in the line as was said earlier also keeping in that point then this is an important this thing once we make the straight box jizzle the lateral entry at making a lateral entry we take care where the medial side has to come so lateral entry within that area could be little anterior could be little posterior but at that stage we have to take with in a posterior position taking care of the leg and then defining it out over that lateral lateral entry where it has to be in that we rotate the uh is it in the direction so that we get a proper angle and that's very important that in this stage then the junction of this with the posterior cortex at the base of the trochanter is the point of entry of our taper reamer once it goes down thereafter we go for the rasping we keep on increasing as it is a standard step wise and till the time uh, we we are basically going step wise so that we don't compromise a layer of the strong trabecular bone we try to assess it up once the femur is adequately broached we find out the proper then as said templating could be digital it could be conventional or a conventional x rays with the kind of a standard this all goes with our own perceptions thereafter we have to prepare and we understand that the if there is a 2 to 3 mm trabecular bone it is likely to provide a very good foundation for interlock of the cement that's important it should not be totally bared out we also understand then we are using a dot type c stem our stem is not likely to fill up all of the cavity and our 2 to 3 mm baby much more in the lower part of this thing 
And then in that scenario, we may not have that fitting. So once we have got appropriate broach, we get the trial and this trialing is likely to tell us whether we have to have an increased length or decreased length depending on how easily it goes in and it goes out. And as was said earlier, we are not doing a shock test in, in this kind of age group because the fracture is likely to give instability otherwise. So we just look if the leg is proper or it is shortened or it's not shortened. And then we have the stability by rotation only. If the rotation and uh, is there or it's not there, that is what we are testing it out. Then obviously we are thoroughly cleaning it. We do use a kind of a restrictor at that stage with the proper sizing. Now that's again a proper. Now there are various kind of restrictors available. Some companies have got a flower tie which you have to cut appropriately so that their this plastic does not create unnecessary pressure all around. So this sizing of that has to be done properly. And sometimes uh, the companies have got a test the size and thereafter you put this specific thing. Then you clear the uh, this thing from the uh, whatever the blood inside is soaked. We need to clean it up. For that, we clean it up, we lavage it up. And after that, we pack up a uh, kind of a, a suction catheter and seal it with the uh, gauze piece over there and do a appropriate suction after adequate lavage so that all this thing, uh, the snake bone, whatever we have the options of, we have got a vacuum mixing, vacuum mixing, if you are using general, we can have that. And now that becomes a point. If a patient is on a high risk scale for cementing, he has already got a SA3, SA4. In that case, we are trying to avoid the pressurization. And for that matter, we do three things, as was said, let the canal be dried out so there remains no marrow which is to push down due to cement, first. Second, we will be little slow in inserting and we may not use even a gun, we may use a long uh, syringes also to push this thing because it is not to be under pressure. If you are using a gun, we have to be very gradual on pressure and that way when we are putting uh, pressure also with the pressurizer also, we have not to be that hard. Even it is sometimes said that we can have a stem and the little cement over that because this is the area where we do not want pressurization over the area with the, uh, this thing over. Yes, we take an implant, we set the centralizer and with that centralizer, which is likely to give, we take out. And now before cementation, we are likely to inform the anesthesiologist because that is the time when the problem is likely to, so he has to look at the oxygenation and that's the most important factor. So start retrograde filling up, backing up at that place, uh, pressurization, and thereafter we have to be again notifying the anesthesia during the time we are maintaining the pressure. Another thing is at that stage, we have to look for the version which we have maintained during pressurization also, because if you are not careful, or the person who is holding the leg is not with sync with you, there could be a rotational reaper. So that is very, very important that the time when we are inserting the stem and the time when we are maintaining it, the uh, synchronization must be with the person who is holding it up, maintaining the angle of placement, the version of placement uh, after this thing, and then we can use otherwise as a standard. So this is again saying that version has to be appropriately maintained along with the uh, version of the stem, along with the version of the neck. And that is something which this position gives us in a much, much better way for the assessment. Once it is done, we need to clean up the cement. And if we are using an uncemented one, obviously this is the uncemented one, which has accordingly to be put up in that kind of a situation. Once it is done and what we have selected uh, in our trial, the proper size of plus, minus and whatever size we choose, we can put up that uh, bipolar over that. That's what we mostly use. And once it is done, now it is the most important part is the capsular repair. In a posterior approach, this capsular repair is much more important because it acts as a constricting effect across the neck. After that, we fix it with the greater to control. So that's very, very important. That would leverage. And then is the wound closer for that matter. Now, looking at that very issue of cemented versus uncemented, as far as no significant difference in the short poster mortality and 
fewer implant related complication occurred in the cemented group rather than the uncemented group. So it is not to be said if you are careful enough, all these studies do say that cemented is not as bad. The, but we tend to think again whether they are ACF1 patient or two patients. So, so that's very, very important. And when, as has already been said, THA versus HEMI, it was considered that THA gives us a better approach. But now the recent literature says no, HEMI arthroplasty has got an equivalent clinical outcome and possibly a lower mortality as far as this report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sen, for that uh, excellent, uh, you know, way of demonstrating how to go about the bipolar orthoplasty step-by-step -step approach. We can take uh, one or two questions and uh, before closing, we have already beyond our scheduled time. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Shubranchu. Uh, I just make a, a small comment uh, uh, on Manal's talk. Uh, Manal has given a wonderful talk as uh, all, of, all the speakers. Uh, one uh, observation that I have in my patients is that if you have a failed fixation, uh, then the uh, impl sending the implant wash for the culture has been found to be very useful in my practice because quite a few times where you are not even suspecting infection, the bacteria can grow. I think that is one point that I like to make. And secondly, that ultrasound guided aspiration where you have a suspicion for it, is a very useful tool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Risa. Yeah. Yeah, sonication also, we do extracted prosthesis for sonication and uh, for uh, culture growth. In that way, implant also will be useful uh, for sonication and, uh, you know, uh, growth of the culture and extended culture for about two weeks would be more helpful. Very right. I think we can probably call that uh, close if there's no more questions. Uh, yes, one, one, I uh, think, uh, yeah, Rakesh, you had a question for me. Yeah, uh, I had actually, I just, for the flow the sake, I just kept quiet. Uh, yeah. Question to both Abhay and Dr. Sain that uh, for totally, I think one probably should stick to uh, the approach which they are familiar with and it's not necessary that they alter their approach. But what about general literature surveys which you have done regarding hemiarthroplasties? So do you change your approach? That's one question. And number two, for all the panels, how many BCIs have you actually seen in your practice? In, all of you might have been crossing about thousands of patients of hemiarthroplasties. So how many BCIs you have actually seen in which the patient died? Yeah. At least I remember two cases with me in last 20 years or whatever it may be. And uh, definitely we could relate the changes, though we were careful also, but the patient was uh, definitely at a high risk area of SA3 probably. And we lost the patient, which we remember in my practice itself, it lasted about five years back. But now taking care of uh, relatively these patients, now we very often do uncemented ones. Whenever patient is SA3 or 4, we go for uncemented. So after going for uncemented, I didn't have it. One I had in PJ that was about 10 years back. So I don't, may not remember the total detail. Uh, there I, might be more. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting uh, observation, Dr. Sen, that uh, three and four, if possible, opt for an uncement. That actually makes a lot of sense. I, I have not seen any, any BCIs, but I, I had one uh, intraoperative debt in a patient of hemophilia where I was doing a revision surgery. So after extracting the astablum, completing the astablum when I was preparing the canal, that time, you know, there was some embolism and uh, there was an intraoperative death. That is the only case what I remember. But for fracture neck tumor, uh, I'm yet to see one. But I have seen two during my fellowship at Wrightington when uh, two patients with, uh, you know, hemia, uh, totally parthoplasty, cemented totally parthoplasty or fracture neck tumor, and they were shifted to ICU during that time. That's all I remember. But is so there to answer your question, the okay, choice sir. of implant? Uh, with respect to the ASA status, uh, Dr. Sen, I mean, do you have any uh, idea if there is any support to this uh, feeling that all of us feel probably is uh, rational? But uh, is there uh, evidence-based support? Yes, yes, yes. There is a lot of literature which we have got right now. That's what I'm quoting also. So there is the very... 
it's not so, that you know yeah. as a grade 3 and grade 4 that always uncemented bone quality is also equally important yeah. yes. so as a 3 and 4 I, I would not use uh, gone and the syringe as uh, dr sen was also mentioning in his lecture i would do a hand packing if the bone quality is not good if the bone quality is good then i use use cemented because on cement as i got a uh, slightly higher risk of periprosthetic fracture Correct. compared to cemented as well and uh, thigh pain as well so the main point is to avoid pressurization, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That is important. Yeah. Uh, sure, uh, uh, Ronan, in one of the case uh, when when I was doing a cemented total hip, uh, when we did the cementing cementation of the uh, cup, uh, there was a sudden drop in the uh, in the uh, oxygen saturation of the patient, and we had to do a, a cementless uh, femur for this patient. So I, I think in my practice, probably uh, so far. Uh, few patients have had this trouble, and that's why for all these uh, sick patients, it is better to do a, a cementless, especially SA3. Yes, yeah, what uh, Shubhranshu and Ramesh have talked about. So to answer Rakesh's uh, questions, two, two questions. One, do you shift to an anterolateral approach uh, because that gives better results for hemis? Uh, you don't. Uh, one does uh, the one approach that works best in their hands. Second thing is with the posterior capsule and without the posterior capsule. So the systematic reviews are very categorical on that. Without the posterior capsular repair, the incidence of dislocation is about 3.23%. And with the capsule repair, it's about 2.2%, which is almost at par with what is seen in the bipolars. As regards the BCIS, and have I lost a patient? Yes, uh, one patient I have lost. And it was, uh, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, the first surgery that we did uh, at the All India Institute about 10 years back. Uh, uh, post that, I've never lost a patient. But then as Sir says that if the mace is less than 5%, you could safely go in and do uh, uh, do, a, uh, do an uncemented stem. Uh, also, judging uh, whether the quality of bone stock is good and are not so good, the frailty of the patient and uh, the other uh, Carlson comorbidity index criteria. And uh, if one has to do a cemented uh, implant, uh, cemented stem, then one has to actually make sure that you don't pressurize. It's just hand packing, as Dr. Montesar said. Right. But still, the problem is not at the time of pressurization. The best, the maximum pressurization gets done at the time of insertion of these stems. So there's no way you can avoid that. Thank you so much. Uh, now, maybe Shubhranchu, if you want to uh, say a few words, yeah. and then uh, I'll request President to speak uh, and close yeah. the webinar. Yeah, I think we are more than two and a half hours now, and uh, we could uh, cover up all the recent updates about the uh, orthoplastic fracture neck tumor, followed by you know, a beautiful uh, lecture by Abhay about uh, in different age groups. Then we delineated about the techniques, how to do a uh, you know, orthoplasty in fracture neck tumor after the failed uh, internal fixations, uh, followed by limb length discrepancy, as well as the, you know, how to do a bipolar. So we have covered everything. Today's hope is it will be helpful for uh, all the delegates who have attended this and those who can uh, view this uh, webinar in YouTube as well. I thank uh, President uh, Dr. Ronan Roy and our uh, webinar chairman, Dr. Rajiv Sharma. And uh, over to Dr. Ronan Roy to give the concluding remarks. Please. Thank you, Kugrangshu. Thank you so much. And uh, I think it's uh, been an excellent uh, webinar. And uh, we've uh, restarted again after a couple of few months. And hopefully it will be smooth sailing from now. And it was a great pleasure having uh, Vikas with us this evening. And I'd like to thank him as well as all the faculty for taking time off uh, on, on the holiday and a special day like this. And uh, I'd also like to thank Shubhanshu for taking this forward and convening this seminar. And uh, last but not least, Rajiv Sharma for agreeing to coordinate uh, these webinars on behalf of the IA. And Ajit, I think it's your turn next. So yep. this month, we're looking forward to great stuff. I mean, Shubhanshu set the bar high, so we want to see an even higher bar next time. Yeah, so thank hopefully. you all so much. So I'll get back to you with some good news over the weekend, after, just after the weekend. Yeah. Um, looking forward to having a webinar on uh, 3D printing in complex hips and uh, revision hips. So Excellent. working on that. So nice. let's see.
let's good see good topic yeah. yeah so we'll be we'll